everyone's doing well today. I'm so glad to see you. Uh, if you'll just remain standing and worship with us, uh, we'll get this started this morning.
your son. We can say that we are sons and daughters. Father, we are so blessed. Far beyond what we have in our pockets, but Father, we are richly blessed with your love. God, we just ask that you take this offering.
ask that you take your copy of God's Word and open it with me to Matthew chapter number 11. Matthew chapter number 11. And are we, we have our children's church for today, kindergarten through um, first grade, if you would like to, you may... Three, four, and five year olds. Okay? Three, four, and five year olds. Uh, you may go back at this time. And if you're a guest of ours, I want to say uh, glad you're here. Welcome. And uh, just feel free to worship with our folks. Uh, so glad that you are here. And um, so grateful. Thankful to God. Uh, just for this opportunity. If you are a guest of ours, we have been preaching through the book of Matthew. Uh, I think next month, maybe, will be two years that it's taken us to get up to uh, Matthew chapter 11. Some folks have asked me, why, why do you do this? Well, we're, we're preaching the Word of God, and uh, it's called exegetical preaching. You just follow the Word of God, you preach the Word of God. Um, and I've had so many folks to, to tell me they've learned so much by following the flow. And, and there is a method to it. And uh, see how God's Word is written. Uh, a lot of times you jump from one place to another. And this morning you're here. And next week you're back here and somewhere else. And, and this just follows the flow. And so. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11. We're going to begin in verse number 1. If you are physically at it, I'm going to ask for you to stand for the reading of God's holy, infallible, inspired, inerrant word. You'll find words similar to these. Now it came to pass, when Jesus finished commanding his twelve disciples, that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison, notice where he is, he's in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he who, of whom it is written. And Jesus goes back and quotes the Old Testament here in Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 3, when he said, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those, listen to this strong language, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, now the violent take it by force for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We mourned for you, and you did not lament. For John came neither eating or drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton, a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works has been done because they did not repent. Father, in Jesus' name, 
God, I pray for these precious people. I know there are people in the early service. I know there are people even under the sound of my voice right now, God, who are struggling. The past few weeks, there are many who have lost their homes. There are many who have been misplaced, displaced, and have no place. And so, God, I pray in the strong name of Jesus that you would bring comfort. I pray you would bring strength. But, God, I pray for those who are lost and undone, who have never given their heart and life to you. God, I pray for salvation to come. But, God, I pray you'd hide me behind the cross. Not that I would be seen but that Jesus would be lifted high. Now, God, do what only you can do in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want to begin by making one simple statement, and it's this. Jesus don't have to tell you everything. Y'all all right? Jesus does not have to tell you everything. Now, you may think you deserve to know everything, and you may think you're a part of the in crowd, and you may think, I ought to know, but let me tell you something. He doesn't have to tell you everything that's going on. As a matter of fact, John, who is cast into prison here, he was, he was put there because of his preaching. Now, you and I, you would think, well, we're good people. We're, we're, hey, we're, we're Christians. Hey, we've been out serving the past few weeks. <clears throat> all these people who's gone out and been affected by this storm and I've done so much and I've done this. Well, listen to the words that describe John the Baptist. Jesus said, of man born of woman, there's none greater than him and he doesn't know everything. Jesus didn't inform him of everything and I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. Now, just to give you a little backdrop of where we are, John is in prison again because of his preaching. King Herod. If you remember the story, he had taken his brother's wife, and John was very vocal about that. John was about preaching truth and things ought to be, and so he preached against their relationship. And so Herod actually was going to have him executed, but because everybody loved John and everybody thought he was a prophet of God, Herod held back on that for a while because he was afraid of all the public backlash that he would get. And so now, here John is in prison, and even though he's been preaching about the Messiah to come, John has now gotten to a place that he is fearful. John has gotten to a place that he is doubting. As a matter of fact, he sends two of his disciples to Jesus to even ask, Hey, are you the one? Are you the one that I've been preaching about? Are you the one that's coming? And guess what? There are many times that you and I face fears and doubts. As a matter of fact, for the past three weeks, uh, and probably longer than that, hearing about the, the hurricanes to come and the storms to come, we've been living in a fearful time. We've been living in a time of uncertainty. We've been living in a time that we have struggled over the past several weeks. we all been there. I don't know about you, but I'm there. I struggled with seeing all the devastation. I had the opportunity yesterday for the very first time to go down and see my mother-in-law's house where several feet of water had been in and now the floors are literally buckled and the mold growing all in the house. And it's just amazing to watch how devastation can come so quickly. And so the home that I, I dated my wife in 33 years ago is is, is now ruined. And, and so it gets to play on your emotions and your thoughts and, and you see things and you begin to think about things. And I think about her being raised there and, 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 and that's a place of all the memories she had up until other than me and Jesus, the best things ever happened to her ever. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you're tracking with me. I'm just making sure you're. But it gets to play with your mind. John's in a place that it begins to play with his mind, and he's, he's doubting, and he's wondering what's really going on. And, and, and so John is sitting here in this prison, and he's wondering, is, is Jesus the one? Well, he's already been preaching about Jesus. He knows he's the one. He's already been preaching about the Messiah. You and I would be kind of like this in our day and time. Is God really going to take care of us? Is God really going to meet our needs? 
Is he really going to do everything that he said he was going to do? And, and that's where John is. And, and, and he sent John exactly what he needed. And folks, I want you to know something. No matter how bad, no matter how bleak it's been the past few weeks, I want you to know God's going to send exactly what you need. It may not be exactly the way you think it's going to be or the way you like it, but I promise you God is going to send everything that we, we, that we need. As a matter of fact, when he meets our needs, he don't even have to tell us how he's going to do that. He don't have to tell you everything. He don't have to show you everything. All we have to do is be obedient in this process of life. As a matter of fact, go back to verse number 2 in chapter 11. And when John had heard, had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? John got to the place that he had doubt. Is this the one, or is it somebody else? He already knew that he was the one. This is the same Jesus he had been preaching about. And I want you to know there was a time when John had no doubt. He stood boldly in the face of Herod and he preached the gospel. He preached truth. He went out in the desert. He preached to everything that moved about the Messiah to come. And now he's thrown into prison and he begins to doubt. Some people uh, make this statement. Um, absence makes the heart grow fonder. That's not the case here. Because John is in a place he can't see Jesus. He's in a place he can't hear Jesus. He's locked up, and he's not where he can actually lay his eyes on him. He's not in a place that he can actually hear him, and so he begins to doubt. Is he the one, or is, is there somebody else coming behind him? Can you only imagine what's going through John's mind? Because if he was the one, I wouldn't be in prison. Y'all all right? If he's the one, I would be out. he would have me out preaching the gospel. I wouldn't be sitting in a prison cell. If he's the one, he would have delivered me already. If he's the one, he would have already fixed my problem. And so here is the good thing about what John did. When he did doubt, he did turn to Jesus. He sent his disciples to Jesus to ask the question. Whenever you're going through something tough, I want you to know something. Jesus is the only one that we can turn to, and that's exactly what John did. Now, I want you to notice the discouragement that John's in. He's thrown into prison. And, and after the past two weeks, is there anybody in here who's been discouraged? Anybody here that's been disappointed? No, I'm the only one. Nobody else has, has faced anything. That's where John is. John was used to being out and on the go and able to do things and being a man who could make things happen. And now he's at a place he can do absolutely nothing but sit in a prison cell. And so he finds himself in a situation he cannot change. There's many of you today, you're struggling because you can't fix the situation you're in because you can't change it on your own. You can't fix it by yourself. He found himself with a problem that he could not solve. And there's many of you until insurance companies and FEMA and all this stuff you deal with for the next several weeks to several months, you can't fix all this stuff on your own. That's where John has found himself. You find yourself there in the scripture with John locked in a place that you just can't seem to get out of. Your emotions, your feelings, your fears, your doubts, all of those things have crept in, and that's exactly where John is at and what he's facing. Not only is he facing discouragement, he's facing disappointment because the one he was preaching about had to come and bail him out of prison. He's still there. The one you would think, the one that I'm preaching about, the one I'm telling this world about, would come get me out of jail. He would deliver me. He's disappointed. And so he's asking the question, is he the one? Is Jesus the coming one? But I want you to know something, folks. There's something we're missing here in all this. Let me ask you a question. You, John's at a place, he's asking why. Why is this happening to me? Why? I, I'm John the Baptist. Jesus is my cousin. If he loved me so much, he would get me out of this mess. If he loved me so much, 
He would fix all this that I'm going through. And why is still a question we're asking today. I'm telling you, the older I get, I'm 51 now. The older that I get, I'm asking this question. Why not me? What, what, what makes me think I'm so much more special than anybody else? Well, why is it that I think tragedy shouldn't happen to, to my family and my home? Why, why not me? Like, we're, we're not any more special. And as a matter of fact, when you look to the cross and you know what God did when he sent his one and only son, how can any of us say we're more special than anybody else? When he saw his own son die on a cross. And so John's missing something here. Don't miss this. This is good. John was more free in that prison cell because he was right where he was supposed to. He was more free in Jesus because he was right where he was supposed to be. Guess what? For the past few weeks, it's been bad. But you've been right where God's wanted you. Going through what you've been going through. Feeling like it's a prison cell. Going through the bad times. Going through the good times. Going through all the times. No matter what. And John was more free in that prison because he was right where God wanted him to be. But the problem was is John started listening to his own doubts. He started listening to his own feelings. He started listening to his own. Uh, matter of fact, if you look at it closely, he's, look, he's facing his own fears. And it's scaring him to death. I'm in prison. And there's word out there going to cut the head off. And he gets in there and he just kind of parks for a while. In his feelings and his frustration and his doubt and his discouragement and his fear. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you listen only to your feelings, when you listen only to your doubt, when you listen only to circumstances that are around you, you're going to end up in trouble. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, is no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with that temptation, he will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That you may be able to endure it. I want you to know something. There's an escape from the prison. There's an escape from the storm. There's an escape from the flood. And God's got the way for us to go. If we'll get our eyes off of ourselves and we'll follow Jesus Christ through it all. Because there's a lot of people that'll say, you know what, you ought to just follow your heart. Are you kidding me? You want me to follow my heart? You know what the Bible says about my heart? It's wicked. Why am I going to follow something that has the propensity to be wicked? Why are you going to follow your heart? You know where your heart is. He said, follow me. I know this, when doubts arise, I know this, you're not alone, you're in good company. As a matter of fact, look in, John, look in Matthew chapter 11, verse number 4. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. And, and notice this, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And notice verse 7. As they departed. And stop right there. The, the, the question is asked to Jesus. From John in prison. And he tells John's disciples. This is what you go and tell them. Jesus could have said anything. He could have responded any way. He could have said. Hey John where's your faith? You were just preaching about me before you were in prison. Before you were in the predicament you're in right now. Before the flood. Before the prison. Before all the, before everything hit the fan. You were good. Your faith was good. Jesus didn't do that to him. Jesus responded in patience. He responded in grace. He responded in love. He responded with the truth of the gospel. Matter of fact, there's something I do know, folks. The gospel is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing, God is sufficient through all things. But I'm like you. I know there's a lot of things that make us doubt. Why? Why did, why did a hurricane come in and not just pass through, 
But he come in and put it in neutral for a few days and just sat on top of us. Why? But why do why do bad things happen to good people? Why our doubts we get in our mind, we get to thinking that's where John's at, that he's sending word back to Jesus. Why is serving God so hard? Why is being a Christian so hard? And then we'll even ask a question, if God is so full of love, how could a loving God do this to us? Same way he sent his only son to a cross. Same way. He watched his own son die on the cross. Because he loves us that much, you want to know how much he loves us? Just look at any cross and you see that great love. There, you know, there's a lot of things I, I don't have the answer for. I'll go ahead and admit it. I don't. I, people ask me questions all the time and I say, you know, I'll go back and look. I'll research it. I'll do the best I can to get you an answer, but I, there's things I struggle with. How, how, how does this work? How do we play all this out? You know what? There's questions I've been asking since I was a little boy. I grew up on a farm 10 minutes down the road. Growing up on a farm, I used to think, how does a brown cow eat green grass and give white milk while sitting under a blue sky and has red blood flowing through it? I don't know. But it happened. Y'all all right? I don't know. But, but God does it. God's got a plan through all of this. And I don't have to have all the whys because I've got the one who has the answer to all the whys. I know I can trust him. No matter what the question is, I can trust him. Amen, now notice this in verse 7. We're, we're almost done here. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning Jesus. Now notice this. They've already gone. The question has come from John in prison. And so they come and ask the question. Jesus has given them the answer. Sent them back to the prison with the answer. And as they're departing, they're not listening to this now. Don't miss this. They're not hearing what Jesus is saying now. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Look at verse 9. But what did you go out to see? There's, a, there's that question that just keeps reoccurring here. What, what did you go out to see? And Jesus answers it again. A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet, for this is he with whom it is written. And he goes back and quotes Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and notice this. Behold, I sin, capitalize there, my, my messenger. John is my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus don't have to tell you everything. Jesus didn't allow those disciples to hear or else they would have gone back and told John. Man, you know what Jesus said about you? Jesus said you was awesome. Jesus said you was great. Jesus said of you that none born here of woman was greater. But they weren't able to go back and tell John that because they didn't hear that. Jesus don't have to tell you anything. And you know what? There's a God in heaven and you ain't him. Notice from those few verses how Jesus described John the Baptist. In verse 7, he said John was one that he wasn't broken by every wind of doctrine. It didn't matter what the Republicans or the Democrats did. He wasn't shaken 
by what they teach or they don't teach. It didn't matter what the schools teach. It don't matter what the Supreme Court says. It don't matter what the White House says. It don't matter what color you are, red or yellow, black or white. He was a man that was not shaken because of anything other than his faith in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 8, he said he's came, he came as one who prepares the way for a king, which Jesus said, that's me. And then in verses 9 and 10, he said, he is my messenger. He is the one who I have chosen to go and prepare the way before I come. And in verse 11, he said, of, of man born of woman, there's none greater. And I want to remind you, John the Baptist, most scholars agree, his public ministry was never more than about six months long. You would think, Man, somebody that, that is that great, man, they'd have a 50 or 60 year ministry. Six months. And a, a man born of woman that was none greater than John the Baptist. Folks, I want to ask you a question here. Why did Jesus wait until those disciples were gone before he talked about the greatness of John? Because they could have easily gone back and filled John's head. And he would have been so puffed up. Hey, Jesus said I was awesome. And by the way, he already thinks you're awesome enough because he went to the cross for you. You know what Jesus said? He said, I was the greatest man born a woman on this planet. No, he, he wanted to keep John in a place of humility. So he wouldn't be puffed up. So he wouldn't think it's about him. And guess what? No matter what's going on in your life and my life, it's not about us. It's about him. And that's what the message is. It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about our circumstances. It's about him. Amen. And Jesus don't have to tell you everything. All you have to do is trust him through the process. Trust him through the storm. You know what he's looking for? He's looking for our obedience. It, it'd be so easy to say, oh, he wants our worship. No, the Bible says he wants our obedience more than our worship. Well, what good does it for you to come and worship if you're not obedient? And so he wants our obedience in spite of our doubts. He wants our obedience in spite of our fears. And so when you feel like you're to the end of your road, and John was, well, when you feel like you've exhausted every possible area of your life, and John had. Just when you think you're left all alone, and John was. There's still somebody pulling for you. There's still somebody who loves you. There's still somebody who cares about you. There's still somebody who wants to work in your life. And by the way, let me just say this. He don't have to tell you everything, but he's everything you need to tell everybody else about. He don't have to tell you everything, but he's everything you need to be telling. Jesus is our enemy. So just when you think you're all alone and nobody cares, where is Jesus in the middle of all this? He's right where he's always been. He's sitting in the right hand of the Father. And by the way, we'll get worried about our homes getting flooded. Guess what? He's preparing us a home we'll never see no flood waters. Y'all all right? He, he's preparing a home. There ain't no hurricane going to touch us. He's preparing us a place that nobody can ever take us away from, that he loves us so much. The only thing he's saying right now, I want you to trust me. I want you to be obedient. And I just want you to do exactly what I've been calling you to do. And I may not tell you everything in the process. That's what trust is. When he don't tell you everything and you trust him anyway. When he don't let you in on every little detail and you trust him anyway. Matter of fact, there might be somebody here today. You're going to trust him for the first time today. And that's through salvation just to say, God, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I need you to speak to my heart, God. I need to change. I've been trying to do this thing 
called life for 20, 30, 40, 50 years or beyond. And all I'm doing is doing the same thing over and over and over and over. You know, that's the definition of insanity. You do the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And you're expecting different results and you don't get it. You know, you know where the different results come in is when you finally just surrender to God. And you just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. I need you to come into my heart, my mind, change my attitude, my behavior, change everything about me, God. I'm repenting, which means to turn. I'm turning from my sin, and I turn to you. And I'm trusting you, God. Maybe you're here, and you're, you're, you lost your home. You're in a place of doubt, a place of fear, a place of uncertainty. You might have lost your job. Family might have walked out on you. You're hurting. Kids have gone crazy. You've done everything you know to do. And all you do is trust him. And that's what he said, just trust me. That's what he's telling John in this. John, just trust me. I am the one. I'm the one. Just trust me. Maybe you're here today and you're hurting. Whatever need you have, this altar is going to be open. I'm going to ask you to stand with us as we sing. You come right now.